this position. The examiner gently grasps the foot at the sides with one hand while supporting the side of the thigh with the other. Care is taken not to exert pressure on the hamstrings as this may interfere with their function. The leg is extended until a definite resistance to extension is appreciated. In some infants, hamstring contraction may be visualized during this maneuver. At this point, the angle formed at the knee by the upper and lower leg is noted and the appropriate square is selected. It is important that the examiner wait until the infant stops kicking before extending the leg. The prenatal frank breech position will interfere with this maneuver for the first 24 to 48 hours of life due to prolonged flexor fatigue. The test should be repeated once recovery has occurred Alternately, a score similar to those obtained for other items in the examination may be assigned. The scarf sign maneuver tests the passive tone of the flexors about the shoulder girdle. With the infant lying supine, the examiner with one hand supports the infant's head in the midline and the infant's hand just above the chest. The thumb of the examiner's other hand is placed on the infant's elbow. The examiner nudges the elbow across the chest, feeling for resistance to extension of the flexor muscles about the shoulder girdle. The point on the chest is noted to which the elbow moves easily prior to significant resistance. Landmarks noted in order of increasing maturity are full scarf at the level of the neck, contralateral axillary line, contralateral nipple line, xiphoid process, ipsilateral nipple line, and ipsilateral axillary line. The heel-to-ear maneuver measures passive flexor tone about the pelvic girdle by testing for resistance to extension of the flexor muscles at the hip. With the infant lying supine, the lower extremity is flexed at the hip so that it rests on the mattress alongside the infant's trunk. The examiner holds the infant's thigh alongside the body with the palm of one hand avoiding pressure on the hamstrings so as not to interfere with their function. The other hand is used to grasp the infant's foot at the sides of the heel and to pull it toward the ipsilateral ear. Using the infant's heel as the indicator, the examiner feels for resistance to extension of the pelvic girdle flexors by noting the point on the body where significant resistance is appreciated. Landmarks noted in order of increasing maturity are when the heel easily reaches the level of the ear, the nose, the chin, the nipple line, the umbilicus, and the femoral crease. This concludes the neuromuscular portion of the assessment. Now we will demonstrate the physical portion of the maturational assessment. The first observation in performing the assessment of physical maturity is the skin. Maturation of fetal skin involves the development of its intrinsic structures concurrent with the gradual loss of its protective coating, the vernix caseosa. Hence it thickens, dries, and becomes wrinkled and or peels and may develop a rash as maturation progresses. Before the development of the epidermis with its stratum corneum, the skin is transparent and adheres somewhat to the examiner's finger. Later, it smooths, thickens, and produces a lubricant, the vernix. Toward the end of gestation, the vernix dissipates, causing the skin to be vulnerable to drying and cracking.
These phenomena may occur at varying rates in individual fetuses, depending in part upon the intrauterine environment. For example, at term and post-term, the fetus may expel meconium into the amniotic fluid. This may add an accelerating effect to the drying process, causing more peeling, cracking, and dehydration, and imparting a parchment, then leathery appearance to the skin. For scoring purposes, the square which most closely describes the infant's skin is selected. The second observation is of the lanugo, the fine hair covering the body of the fetus. In extreme immaturity, the skin lacks any lanugo. It begins to appear at approximately the 24th to 25th week and is usually abundant, especially across the shoulders and upper back, by the 20th.